Roedeer is by far the most widespread big game species in Germany and I put it that in adverted commas because in Germany it's actually categorized as small game. For me it is big game. Still it seems that Roedeer is not fully understood. We don't understand why they do certain things and how they move and where they live and and I've had a, a really a, a passion in trying to understand them more. I think in Germany per year we hunt over one million roe deer, which is a big number and it's the most widespread species all over Europe. And I'm looking forward to understand more day by day. And many days I wake up and I think I know nothing. And some days I think I know a little bit, but there's so much more to discover. My name is Franz Albrecht Oettingen Spielberg and come and join me for the management and hunt of my favorite five game species. These are not um, to save my ears from the from the noise because obviously we have a sound moderator and it's not I don't usually need to put them in but I still do um, when I'm zeroing the gun just to make sure that I don't um, that I don't flinch when I shoot we had it was the first time I shot the gun since last year because now we are starting our robux season in Germany it's the beginning of May and I just made a few practice shots. At 100 meters, we were two or three centimeters high and one or two centimeters to the right. So we corrected that. Now the gun is very nicely sighted in and we can go off and do some robot stalking. We spotted one of the bucks that we want to shoot this year just on the other side of this ridge. He has incredibly long um, front tines. He's four to five years old. And he's in a tricky position where we want to take him out this year because there's a main road and a lot of our bucks get taken by the, by the cars there. Our wind is not great, but there's really no other situation to get close to him. So we're gonna have to take a risk come over the ridge with relatively bad wind and hopefully um, be able to take a shot before he sees us or smoke. The buck should be just on the other side of this ridge. There's a high seat there which we might use to get some elevation because he's down in a valley. Um, I'm gonna get ready now because, as I said, the wind is bad. We're gonna have to take some risk to get close.
My grandfather was a, a big connoisseur of roe deer. He loved roe deer. Uh, my father um, brought me into that culture that we have in the family. And of course, I've always had a great passion for it because it's my home. And we live from forestry and we work with agriculture. So the balance between a good, well-growing forest and the roe deer population, that's a touchy subject. Of course, the roe deer damage uh, or can damage um, the young trees. And therefore, this is something that is an, it's an everyday topic for us. He went only maybe 30 yards from where we shot. But in this high grass, it was impossible to see where he went down. And he's a perfect buck to take out. He's thin in the horns. Oh, he's older. He looks he's older. Yeah, I mean, I would say five minimum. And he's very close to the road. So I'm very happy that we've taken him. We've lo we lose a lot of road deer here, and it's not only about the road deer, but it's also dangerous for, for the cars. Because if they make a sudden movement when there's a road deer on the road, we've had some car crashes as well. So that's the pain in this part of the hunting area. But um, we just have to live with that. Very nice buck. We have been one of the front runners, if not the front runner, for saving fawns from sure death through mowing of grass, the first grass cut every year. The females, the does, like to give birth in high grass because that gives a lot of cover for the fawns. Therefore, they can't, can't be found by, um, by foxes, etc. The first um, danger reaction of fawns is to stay put. They don't run. They have no smell, so they're neutral uh, in smell. That, that means that animals like foxes, etc., can't smell them. They have to really stumble upon them. And um, yeah, their, their safety mechanism is to stay put and stay hidden as long as possible. So if there is a tractor coming with a big mowing equipment, that fawn will stay, stay there. So what we do, we have contact with the farmers. Um, they call us before they're going to mow one of their meadows. And then our team comes with a drone, with a thermal camera. It was sponsored by Verein Deutsche Wachtelhunde Landesgruppe Baden-Württemberg Nord. And two or three guys, they fly over that area early mornings. They sometimes get up at three o'clock in the morning to be able to do that, because of course the ground needs to be fairly cold the weather needs to be cold for the thermal camera to work. And um, they then find the fawns, take them out of that area. The farmer then mows, and then they're put close to that area so the, the doe can find them. We've been working together with a technical university in Munich who have done their own study to try and figure out how the movement of does and fawns is during the time of birth and the few weeks after. That's been a long ongoing year long project to be able to understand better the movement and the habits of roe deer. And therefore we also tag the roe deer in alternate ears depending on the year and with alternate colors of tags and each one of them is numbered as well. So we know exactly if let's say number one uh, you see a, a road ear with a tag that, that says number one is a green tag in the red ear. We know exactly how old that fawn is. And if you look back in the list, number one, we can also tell you the exact spot where that road ear was tagged. So that's been uh, an incredible insight and it's given us a much better understanding of what goes on uh, within road ear population. And additionally to that, what has happened uh, what, what it's given us is that once you then shoot one of those roe deers, 
with an ear tag that says it's six years old, we can finally look at the bottom jaw and compare, knowing 100% that that animal is six years old, how that bottom jaw looks. seen him up close and I'd like to have a good look at him. He might be a shooter as well. Let's have a look. It's, it's really interesting. I've had the pleasure and the good fortune to be able to, to hunt roe deer almost everywhere in Europe. And even though it's all the same species, Capriolos Capriolos, they, they seem so different and they look so different in every country that I've hunted them. I mean, a Romanian buck, in terms of body size, head size, and the average trophy size, for me is almost closer to a Siberian buck in terms of how he looks and, and the weight, etc., than the bucks that we hunt here in Germany. and I'm shooting a very fast bullet, which is a 6x62 Frere with an 87 grain VMAX Hornady projectile. So we're touching a thousand meters per second. So while this is an amazing, amazing caliber and amazing projectile for long distance shots, because it's so light, you have to be extremely careful with the side wind. At the moment, we had no wind but there was a lot of little grass um, in the middle, uh, in front of the road here, and also about 100 meters in front of it, there was also quite a lot of grass. So I had to be extremely careful, and I couldn't see any of the body, but I had a small gap right on the neck. And I tried to get as comfortable as possible, and I just managed to squeeze that shot off just on the top part of the neck. He was looking at us here. I felt comfortable and I think it was the only last chance we had. I really wanted to shoot this buck because he was earmarked as a fawn and with a, a scientific experiment that we're doing with the Technical University in Munich. So we, exact, we know exactly how old this buck is and it's one of the bucks that we wanted to get this year for sure. So I'm happy it all worked out but it was very slim. He was nearly gone, nearly. Each of these animals not only, not only have a tag, but the, the, the tag also has a number. This, for example, is number 65, uh, four years ago. So we know exactly, if we look at our list, where this fawn was born, and we can understand where this buck from where he was born has taken his territory. And there are some that stay in exactly the same territory. There's some that, as I've just said, move 25 kilometers away. And it's just given us an incredible insight or more of an insight into what this species is about. Um, I still believe I know very, very little about roe deer, but this project has helped us immensely. And it also helps when you see a buck ha that has an ear tag, you know exactly how old he is. And it's made me realize that really trying to judge the age of a buck that you don't know is, it's a hit and miss. And sometimes you get it right, but almost just as often you get it wrong. So from a management point of view and from a selective point of view, this has been amazing uh, for us. I wouldn't be able to tell how many roe deer we've marked, but it's in the thousands. Now marking uh, roe deers or tagging roe deers is, is illegal and it's in, in Germany. And the only way that we were able to do that is through 
this cooperation with a technical university in Munich who conceded the, the license to do it. In general, it's not allowed. As you can see, for a four-year-old, it's really a selective buck. He's thin, uh, hardly any purling, he's not very high, small coronets, small head, small body, so he's also a perfect selective buck to take out. But would I have seen Yes, I would have probably shot him anyway, even if I didn't have an earmark, because it's, even as a three-year-old he would have been a shooter, but I would have put him in between three to five, and I know exactly now that he's four. But it's been interesting now, since the, the weather's got, uh, since that storm has passed and the rain has stopped, um, the rodeo movement has picked up immensely, and you can just hear the bells in the background. It's 12 noon now. We've been out since five in the morning, and it's been an absolute pleasure but we're not going home yet. I think rodeo is a fantastic species that is l not understood very well. The old Duke of Bavaria was one of the first people in the 60s, 70s, 80s who really tried to scientifically study rodeo. Of course, nowadays there are so many more possibilities 